In the words of the wise philosopher Bruce Springsteen, we gotta get out while we're young, cause tramps like us, baby, we were born to run. So how did we become runners? That is a topic of today's Footnoting History. Hello there, I'm Esther and welcome to the March 30th edition of Footnoting History, because the best stories are always in the footnotes. I want you to look at your foot. Better yet, I want you to put your hand on your foot. Start at your heel and trace down the line of your arch and then run your fingers along the tips of your toes. What you're feeling right now is in my opinion, one of the most ingenious evolutionary pieces of biomechanical technology. Your feet allow you to stand upright, they allow you to walk, and most importantly for today's topic at least, your feet allow you to run. Now we're running creatures. We always have been running creatures, but this hasn't always been apparent to researchers who study evolutionary biology. The essential practice of long distance running as being part of who we are as both mammals and social creatures has only really been seriously discussed in the last 30 years or so. We really have to stop for a minute to think about running in a different context to even begin to understand how it was necessary for the survival of early humans. In present times, running has become a popular way to promote physical fitness. It's a way in which you can fit into your favorite pair of jeans or perfect your own self-image, whatever that might be. So we really have to get away from our modern conceptions for a little bit and what running represents to us today to really understand the context of how our ancestors ran to survive, how they ran to live, and most importantly, how by extension we developed. You could be asking yourself why a history podcast series is focusing on what might be a strictly scientific topic. But I think that the study of history shouldn't only begin with the invention of writing, which only happened a few thousand years ago. Our direct human ancestors were around for tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of years before they even picked up the ability to write or even form a coherent language. So let's take some of this evidence and research that scientists have discovered in the last few decades and try to understand them as a coherent historical narrative in the best way that we possibly can as non-scientists lay people. Now some of these stories are going to be, or some of these story beats rather, are going to be familiar to lots of you who have even a cursory understanding of early human development. We started out as tree-dwelling primates in the primeval jungles of the African continent. And around 40 million years ago, these primates began to develop opposable thumbs, which are needed for grasping food and tree branches. And over the next few millions of years, they became increasingly acrobatic, swinging from these trees and walking on their branches. And this ability to walk on branches really helped our primate ancestors to adapt to walking upright on the ground and millions of years later to begin running. So why did these, uh, shall we call them prehumans, begin to walk upright? Now, the answer to this seems to lie in climate change. The Earth went through many environmental changes throughout its very long history, and this was just one of them. The process in which prehumans became bipedal, meaning they developed the ability to walk on two feet rather than four, can be explained by these major ecological and climatic changes that occurred on the African continent. The forests and jungles, which were once dense with trees, began to thin out over time. And about seven million years ago, many of these forests gave way to large patches of grassy areas, which we call savannas. And these savannas were very prevalent in Eastern Africa, which is where we find our human origins. And in order to navigate these grassy plains and to travel from one place to another, prehumans slowly began to develop the necessary limbs to stand up straight, to walk, and much later, much, much later, uh, go scavenging and hunting. So our bodies hold the keys to understanding how we began to walk, and most importantly, how we began to run. Bipedalism did come at an enormous cost to our spine and feet. Our ancestors' upright positions put strain on both these areas. Uh, two feet were now doing the work of four. Now, if you were to compare our feet with those of uh, chimpanzees, who are our closest living relatives, 
in the sense that, you know, we had a common ancestor as recently as six million years ago. Uh, you can see sort of the differences um, that I'm trying to get at. The chimp's foot looks pretty similar to a hand. It's actually very flexible and is able to perfectly grasp at tree branches and climb up trees with no problems at all, because that's kind of what it's made to do. But since early humans had to adapt to walking on these grassy plains, to walk on the ground, their feet, that is our feet, had to become more rigid. And the big toe eventually became aligned with the other toes on the foot to affect a better balance. It also lost its grasping function. And the other toes also eventually became longer and they be became much stronger. And when we take a step, the foot acts as a lever. And this lever arm efficiently transfers the necessary locomotive force from your calf all the way to your ankle to propel the upright body forward. The fossil records show that about 2 million years ago, humans developed the ability to run in order to more easily scavenge and hunt for food in the African savannas. Now, it's only really been until recent times that this hypothesis has been put forward, because when we think of the potential evolutionary advantage that running might give to an animal, we tend to think of speed more than anything else. And humans, well, let's face it, are simply not very fast compared to other mammals in the animal kingdom. Our best Olympic sprinters, for example, can reach up to 27 miles per hour at their top speeds, which is pretty impressive for the Olympics, but not very impressive when it comes to survival out in the wilderness with animals who can easily outrun you. The cheetah, by far the fastest animal, which could go as fast as 62 miles per hour, can use its super speed to hunt down other animals, like the antelope. And then the antelope can use its super speed for escaping animals that would want to prey on it, such as the cheetah. So obviously, for many animals, speed is a pretty important factor for survival. And for the longest time, speed was the only factor considered in any discussion about the role of running in the grand scheme of evolutionary history. But what if speed didn't really matter when endurance can make up for all of the deficits an animal had in speed? About 2 million years ago, early humans developed special features that allowed for endurance running that their other hominid relatives did not have. Our feet were made for running, as I, as I already discussed, you know, especially um, our long Achilles tendons that act as springs and foot arches that stabilize our bodies. But we should also consider other features that made early humans unique when we compare them with other hominids. The first I want to talk about is the nuchal ligament, which stretches from the base of our skull to the base of the neck and which is something that you can't find in apes, but you can find in other running animals, such as horses. This ligament is like an elastic band that prevents the runner's head from bobbing violently. And uh, the second feature that I want to talk about is our very impressive booty. Yes, I am talking about our butts. We've got really nice asses for running, and we have big asses too, comparatively speaking. The muscles of our derriers contract every time we run, but not when we walk. Chimpanzees, uh, by contrast, have very little rear ends. So if you want to see how difficult it is to run without much of a butt, go outside and squeeze what I'm sure is your very impressive butt cheeks with both hands and then try to run. You'll see that it will be close to impossible to do that. The third uh, feature that I want to talk about is the very simple fact that we sweat and don't have a furry coat. Although there's a whole human subculture today dedicated to having fun with furry coats, so maybe we miss having them. Who really knows? Other animals have to pant in order to cool down their bodies when they're running. But sweat does this very efficiently for us, and it allows us to run uh, for longer periods of time. It's a great cooling system. In 1983, the paleontologist Dennis Bramble and his student David Carrier found that other animals were seriously limited when they run and able to cool themselves down because they can only take one breath per stride. Their bodies really don't allow for more than that. But humans can take up to one or two breaths for up to four strides, depending on how well they run, which gives them lots of oxygen to run at a variety of speeds and for long distances. So there's a lot of biological evidence that humans are born with the innate ability to go long distances. In 1984, uh, the same David Carrier, uh, the student, he published an influential paper that theorized specifically that early humans were daytime endurance runners. 
the basic idea was that our early ancestors, who are hairless, they're sweaty, they have these callous feet, and most importantly, they're hungry as hell, so they're motivated. They would run for hours at a time after their prey. The animal, uh, without the ability to sweat or rest for a very long time, would get overheated and eventually collapse. Early humans uh, could never outrun their prey. They just simply did not have that speed. But they could get the upper hand when the animal got too exhausted. And this is pretty significant information, I think, if you're a historian, or at least interested in the history of early human culture, because we might imagine that many of the rituals that are crucial to the long-term survival of these early human communities, such as eating and hunting and forming friendships and family bonds, depended upon this ability to endure running long distances in the heat. One could see how very specific practices revolving around trust and companionship and basic forms of communication came out of the need to coordinate the hunt on these long-distance runs. The anthropologist Lieberman went so far as to suggest that running might have fueled the evolution of large hominid brains. If you can run down animals and hunt them down, or even run to carcasses that have been abandoned and use your rudimentary tools to get to the parts that haven't been eaten by hyenas or other predators, then that extra protein and fat are going to be pretty beneficial to building a larger brain over time. And surely, by the time we get to our direct ancestors, the Homo sapiens, they are lankier, uh, but definitely smarter than the hominids that came before them. And so now this brings me to those poor Neanderthals who went extinct about 30,000 years ago and who sort of get a bad rap because artistic and pop cultural representations of them have not been very kind over the years. The Neanderthals were actually extraordinarily big brain creatures and gifted hunters. They were pretty skilled weapon makers to boot. And unlike those skinny Homo sapiens who would have subsisted on root vegetables and plants and saved their meat for special occasions, the Neanderthals were a bit more picky about their diet. They seemed to be only interested in eating meat, and their skills in hunting, not running down animals, but rather ambushing them, served them well in their carnivorous ways. But only for a time, because when the Earth began to go through another one of its long series of climate changes and it started to get a little hot out, this long winter on Earth ended. The forests, again, began to shrink, and the parched grasslands uh, left in its wake were perfect for runners, but not so much for ambushers. Ambushes worked great on big animals, on big game. That's what the Neanderthals loved to hunt but it didn't work so great on fast prairie creatures. And one of the reasons that Neanderthals didn't, and perhaps couldn't, adopt the hunting strategies of long distance runners was because, at least it is believed, that they were too stocky and ultimately too heavy and too muscly to be very efficient runners. And as the forests receded, the Neanderthals did too, disappearing with them. So if evolution were a chess game, Neanderthals might have won, hands down, against a Homo sapien just by using their intelligence and keeping their wits about them. But, as it turned out, they were simply no match when it came to being long-distance runners. This has been Footnoting History. If you liked our podcast, be sure to check us out on the web at footnotinghistory.com, where you can find links to our Facebook page and Twitter feed, as well as information about upcoming podcasts. Join us next week, when we'll be talking about our favorite stories from the French Revolution. Until then, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes. See you next week!